Hello, and thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Zimmerman, director of the Coalition of Public Independent Charter Schools, and we're really pleased to present this webinar for you. Uh, I'm going to cut directly to the chase and introduce the moderator. Rob Pilkington is superintendent of Village Green Virtual, which is a blended learning charter school in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Rob has been working with us and advising CPICs since the very beginning, and he has a tremendous perspective on the work that we're doing. So, Rob, what are we doing today? Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. And today we are going to hear the stories of four schools pushing the boundaries of both learner experience and teacher experience. These schools are harnessing the power of the internet to pave new ways of providing students with high quality instruction in a true 21st century environment. Now, as we all know, distance learning has been around for a long time. Correspondence courses emerged in the early 1700s, but it wasn't until the advent of the internet that we saw the power of online learning usher in a new style of pedagogy. Professionally, my life changed in, in, in amazing ways. In 2001, when I read Corinne Hadley's Any Time, Any Place, Any Path, Any Pace, she was the president of the NASBE, and she foretold of a future where online or virtual education would create new avenues of opportunity and challenge. Hadley envisioned a not too distant future where technological advances plus the changing demographics and changing marketplaces would, would force regulators and institutions to grapple with massive shifts in, com in consumer demands and the subsequent need for our industry to update our policies, our practices, and our systems. Now, there's no better place than the Coalition of Public Independent Charter Schools to carry this conversation forward as we are the research and development arm of public school innovation. You know, disruptive innovations start at the periphery and move to the mainstream over time and the time for embracing a new method of schooling has arrived. So without further ado, let's get on with our webinar, meet some forward thinking colleagues from unique schools, ask and answer questions that inform and break myths, and interact with each other through real time polls, converse with movers and shakers, and pr to begin to bring our charter innovations to our sister schools, whether they be public charter or public district. So right now we'd like to do a round robin introduction of our four schools and four presenters as they give a very quick snapshot of who they are, where they're from, who they serve. So moving right into it, Inspire Schools from California. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everybody. My name is Kimmy Buzzard. I'm from Inspired Charter Schools. Um, we are a school, a network of schools. We serve uh, students in the state of California in 29 counties um, in, in the state. Uh, we serve students in TK through high school, so all grade levels. Um, and just a little note about how our school is funded um, in California. Um, it's through the ADA, the Average Daily Attendance, um, and through the LCFF funding formula. So, um, pleasure to be here. Um, can't wait. This is going to look great. Okay, moving um, to Edvisions. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Gigi from Edvisions off campus. We are in Henderson, Minnesota. Well, at least our post office boxes. Our students are across the state of Minnesota. We serve 113 students, 7th through 12th grade. We use a project-based learning model online with our students. We, um, in the state of Minnesota, have two ways that you receive funding from online schools. One is more of a traditional seat-based, if you're a completely comprehensive program, meaning students are completely enrolled with you and you take attendance and have um, that type of information, or you can get supplementary education funding, which is based on course completion. Okay, Minnesota Online High School from Minnesota. Hi, I'm Elisa Rafa, and um, we serve students in grades 9 through 12 across Minnesota. Our office is in St. Paul, but our teachers and students are geographically dispersed. Um, how our state funds the school, you heard from Gigi that there are, there's comprehensive and supplemental enrollments in Minnesota, so we do both. 
Um, we'll talk in a little while about what split we do, but um, but some schools do both. Some do some programs do one or the other. We do both. So we serve students who choose us as their school districts district, and students who stay enrolled somewhere else and just take courses with us and carry those credits back to their school. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Metro East. Hi, my name is Tanya Gemhart, and I'm from Metro East Web Academy. We are a virtual charter school here in Gresham, Oregon, which is just outside of uh, the county lines of Portland. Uh, we serve students K through 12 with five different programs and our funding uh, is drawn from what we call average daily membership. So uh, the number of days a student is enrolled is based on how we're funded. Um, with charter schools, we get about 80% of that funding uh, and 90 per, for K-8 and 95% for our high school students. The rest is then uh, given back to the district for sponsoring us in that, that area. So we're funded a little bit differently than the full ADM. But welcome, I'm glad you guys are here. I'm so excited to be able to present and share our stories. Okay, thank you, Tanya. And now it's time for our first polling question. So do you already have an opinion about virtual online schools? If so, what is it? No opinion? It's probably good for some students. It's definitely the future of education or it's a waste of public money. Okay, are we good to move on? Okay, and we'll be back with the results of that poll pretty quickly, but right now we'd like to move into what we call the school showcase. And this is where we're gonna give our, our uh, host schools, our guests an opportunity to tell a fuller picture about their schools, their school's life, their founding stories, their guiding principles, their mission, their values, a description of the learner experience. They're gonna talk about some of the myths and challenges and, and, and the hardships and opportunities that they have found in this unique sector of our industry. So we're gonna start with Inspire Charter Schools of California. Kimmy, you're on. To unmute. There we go, much better. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Yep, uh, pulling up the presentation here, hopefully it came through. There we go. Awesome. Well, hi again. This is Kimmy um, from Inspire. Um, we, I represent a, a family of charter schools here in California, and um, we currently have nine of them um, serving those 29 um, counties I talked about. We're a non-state based charter, so um, we don't have brick and mortar buildings that the kiddos go to. Um, we focus on personalized learning um, and the whole child. Um, and that's really, really why um, you know, Inspire was created. Um, not only to ensure that there are high quality educational choices out there for, for families and for students, um, but, but to make sure that we're trying to uh, provide something unique out there in, in the universe. Um, we know that children learn many different ways. And so um, for the families who are looking for an independent study or a homeschooling model, um, Inspire is able to provide that um, support and, and learning environment for them. Um, another very important reason why Inspire was created is, is um, come straight from our um, founder, um, Dr. Nick Nichols, um, is to create a, a wonderful place for educators to work, um, where employees are given a great wage, excellent benefits, um, and where respect is prized and, and practiced um, on, at all levels. Um, and so we have really uh, strived to create a place where educators can um, be professionals, um, can um, support students um, in this creative platform, and um, we're, we're really enjoying and seeing uh, a lot of benefits to it. Um, our guiding principles um, center around our school motto, which is caring for students, 
um, appreciating parents, which um, we define as listening to our parents and respecting each other. And so all of our decision making, everything that we do really does center around those three um, tenets. Um, Personalized learning is extremely important to us, um, making sure that our uh, students are able to pursue their interests and passions and tap into learning that way. Um, so as to you know, maximize um, that level of interest and channel it towards their learning plans. Um, the choice and flexibility is something that our families have come to know us for and really seek out. Um, as there are so many different ways that we are able to align the Common Core state standards um, with creativity and um, a lot of unique um, opportunities and activities. Um, the whole child, of course, we want to make sure that our students are not only progressing academically, but that, you know, socially and behaviorally and emotionally, they are well. And so our teachers do an amazing job of partnering with the families. And you'll hear me talk a lot about um, partnership um, that we have, um, not just amongst you know, our different school departments, but particularly um, with our parents. Um, and then making sure that we always come back to just doing what's best for kids. Um, so why we're in um, this business of education, um, why we do what we do. We do serve all grade levels, um, and that's one of the things that makes our school unique, um, so that we can actually serve an entire family um, of, of, of children and students, um, regardless of their, their grade level, um, which is something that our families really value. Um, so if they have a little, and they've got a middle school student and a high school student, everyone can come to Inspire, and the whole family does it together. Um, we are able to, because of the flexibility of our model, meet the needs of all students, whether those are struggling learners, uh, language learners, advanced learners, um, students who have special needs um, or have an IEP of some sort, a 504 plan. Um, we are able to you know, provide um, and craft and create a learning plan to meet the needs of all of those, those students. Um, we primarily have a, a, a large, large group or niche of um, homeschooling families. Um, I feel like um, those families have been looking for um, the ability to, you know, have that flexibility to have a flexible schedule, um, have uh, flexibility in terms of curriculum choice and platform. Um, you know, we know that all of those students learn differently. And so homeschooling really does, um, has found a home here at Inspire. Um, and then making sure that we're continually serving our students and families um, very well. Um, and, and that we're, because we're so spread out um, throughout the state, we do have, you know, regional differences, um, preferences, needs, um, and we, make sure that we are responsive to those so that we're serving not just one cookie cutter, you know, this is one thing, it's um, moldable, adaptable, responsive to the needs of the community. All right, here we go. Um, this is that partnership that I was talking about. It really does make inspire what it is, that partnership between the student, the teacher, and the parent, and collectively crafting that personalized learning plan tapping into those interests, tapping into the learning modalities, the way a child, um, that particular child learns best. And then um, I won't spend too much time on this, um, but we do really make sure that we are providing the best of the best for our students, um, that we are giving them the resources and the tools to be successful um, while making learning fun. Um, you know, and that's where that enrichment component is, wherein they're able to, um, you know, if they are interested in robotics and learning, that they 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 can do that. Um, I'm just checking my time here. I don't want to um, go over. Okay, I think. Well, you're, well, you're doing very well, Kimmy. We're right okay. on schedule. Good, good, good. Okay, great. <laughs> you just 
you know, cut me off if you need to. <laughs> no, 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 would never, please. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and, and it's through the, the creative use of the funding that the public school receives, um, you know, from the state or from the lottery or the LCFF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are able to um, allocate certain funding for specific, um, you know, use. Um, now, if we, we call that here at Inspire instructional funding, um, it's just a term that we've um, developed as a way to communicate to the families that, um, you know, from the state funding that we get or from wherever we get it, that, that, that we can use it in an interesting way. It doesn't have to be everything the same for everybody. Um, but we do hold very, very true and are very, very um, concerned and aware and um, do a lot of education, um, not only with our staff, but with our families as well, that these instructional funds are always used um, and must be used for edu um, educational purposes. Um, so an item, whether that be a book or a service, like an activity for enrichment or something like that, it has to have educational value. It also has to be of educational quality um, and then also ed educational um, quantity. So keeping those three things in mind helps us ensure that we are being great stewards and of, of the public funds um, and that we're using them appropriately. And then those non-consumables, of course, those are going to come back to the school and actually um, be um, shared with other students who might be able to, to reuse something like that. And so this kind of just gives you a little um, insight into um, you know, how our academic program functions, why it's unique, why it's special. Um, and, um, you know, Rob was talking about this sort of dispelling myth. Um, and one of the things that we hear quite a bit is about our students, um, because they're homeschooled or they do independent study or they don't go to a traditional brick and mortar school, that, that somehow they're not being socialized properly. Um, and that is, you know, not true. Um, our kids are extremely active, um, not only with their peers, but with um, older students, younger students, community members. Um, they're involved in all kinds of um, wonderful um, clubs and um, community sponsored, um, you know, community service sort of related organizations. Um, and so they are out in forest all the time. Um, we've got field trips, we've got leadership um, opportunities through National Junior Honor Society or Academic Decathlon. And um, so wanting to make sure that we try to do our part here and sharing that, you know, our kids are actually extremely social and they are um, getting hands on real life learning opportunities that will serve them well for years and years to come. Um, one of the things we were also asked to address um, in this webinar was about the political climate. Um, and um, from, I can share sort of from our perspective as um, a independent study, non site based charter school, that the political climate in California isn't always super friendly. Um, you know, communities and the families are desiring different and varied educational options, um, you know, for whatever reasons in the in the traditional brick and mortar, they're, they're looking for other things. Um, um, and the, the great thing about education, I think, um, throughout the United States is that now there are so many different choices. I mean, before you kind of think about, oh, there's traditional neighborhood schools or there's private schools, or you can kind of homeschool and, and you know, be off the grid. But um, really, truly, now there's so many different variations. There's the, you know, the the online technology schools that focus on that. There's the magnet schools, there's the, you know, CTE programs that, that are out there. And so Inspire is, is doing our best to, to provide a, a really great option um, out there as a, as a choice, a choice for families. Um, you know, so um, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best to forge on and, um, you know, despite those anti-charter groups and, um, you know, sentiments that are out there, we just, you know, put on um, our, you know, positive spirit and brave face and, and just try to tell our story um, and about the work that we are trying to do serving our communities by providing an educational option for families. Um, and then 
continuing to you know partner with the schools that are are like um, here on the webinar or you know other schools like schools in in California I'm just trying to build partnerships share best practices um, and I think one of my hopes was that you know we could make some connections with all of you out here um, so that we can start you know even beyond the webinar continue these dialogues and conversations about school choice um, and about different educational opportunities for families. All right Kimmy thank you so much thank you for uh, for for that 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 showcase on inspire I, I'll tell you one of the things I really love is to see the pictures of the kids because one of the myths is is that in in a non-classroom based model that you're, you're somehow devoid of, of community or or human connection and I think that it's it's terrific let's let's take a look at the important takeaway message here uh, very quickly we support and respect the family's right to choice that's a hallmark of chartering and we focus on educational innovation and creativity while at the same time ensuring student growth and progress through grade levels it's a it's a it's a fascinating and very important uh, uh, work that you're doing out in California, Kimmy. I think that we're going to go now and uh, we're going to move on to Advisions off campus from Minnesota. So, um, hi, I'm Gigi again from Advisions off campus. And actually, um, Alisa and I are both from Minnesota online schools. And so we plan on doing a little bit of a presentation together, a little bit about our schools, but more um, importantly, just some aspects about teaching um, within the, the online learning era. Um, so we're going to start with this. We begin with the hypothesis that any subject can be taught effectively in some intellectually honest form to any child at any stage of development. And that's a quote by Jerome Bruner um, back in 1960. But we have a discussion question for you. So any subject can be taught by in some intellectually honest form with either set of tools pictured above. And so we want you to let us know if you agree or disagree with this statement on this question. And you can move your window to the side if you need to see those pictures, so it's a laptop and pencils and paper. So again, you are agreeing that any subject can be taught in some intellectually honest form with either said tools pictured above or disagreeing. And then if you wouldn't mind following that up with a quick comment in the chat if you have further follow-up of why you agree or disagree with these tools being intellectually honest form for students. So we'll take it in both manners. And it looks like 94% of you agree. And so any of the commentary you have, I need to find my chat just a second, um, that you have. Importantly enough, I realize that I can't. This is it. There we go. Important aspect. I can't see the chat. So um, there they go. Screens of very young learners is always an interesting comment um, and debate among um, educators. <laughs> Instructional design is the key. Once teachers are trained to use the tools effectively, they can implement them. So one of the things that we would like to discuss, we're gonna introduce our schools very briefly, um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about these tools. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to talk about Manila. Thanks, Gigi, and thanks everybody for um, indulging us in that question. It's really interesting how many people, how really, how many, many people said yes. So, um, Gigi, if you want to change the slide for me, um, I'll just say next slide. So, this is our school's mission and vision statement, both very wordy, um, but I think, and I actually should have highlighted some words, but I think, I think the important words here are fl challenging, flexible, um, responsive, creative, supportive. That's that's what we're trying to be. Um, and in terms of a vision, which we are actively working toward, but certainly not there yet, I think we think of ourselves as a hub of learning. So some of what students do is with Minnows teachers in Minnows courses, we have courses, we have a learning management system, people are asking about platforms, we have all of that. 
um, but we also have a desire to support as much community-based learning as possible, work-based internships, um, service learning, or helping students to get to, to have part of their academic program be the things that they're already passionate about. And we've got students who are doing incredible stuff on their own time. Um, it's, it's just amazing. And sometimes choosing online learning to support that as a way of making school fit around what they, what's meaningful to them. Next slide, please. So um, Minnows opened in 2005. It was organized by a team of educators who had worked together in online learning since 1996. That was before there was a webinar, just to say. Um, it was fully asynchronous. We've moved, and we still have a strongly asynchronous model because we are designed for students who need a flexible schedule, but we provide lots and lots and lots of synchronous support, and we also work together. There are 32 of us on staff right now, and we work together um, all day, or at least 10 to 2, those are our core hours, but all week, all day, um, in, in contact with each other, with students, with their parents and guardians, with counselors, social workers, so that we can figure out what's best um, with the student, for the student. Our focus is on active learning, authentic assessment, and self-advocacy. Um, we have a highly collaborative work and learning environment, and one way that we achieve that is that we're committed to relatively low student teacher ratios especially in the online world so that's one of the myths we want to bust later that i'm personally interested in busting is the idea that online learning is a personnel reduction strategy as rod said earlier um, at minnows we maintain low student teacher ratios we work really hard to build relationships we use technology to build relationships and i think that in terms of the learning program and when i'm talking about authentic assessment active learning i'm talking about learning with rather than from technology, which is why we showed you those pencils, um, and which is why we're, we wanna talk about instructional design and the student and teacher experience, um, and a relationship to technology that doesn't start with pushing content towards students, quite the opposite. Next slide. Um, we were asked to do a, a summary of our enrollment, sorry. So um, right now we're serving 200, this was a snapshot yesterday, 238 students who have chosen Minnows as their district and 75 which, who are called supplemental, which are just taking one or two or three courses from us usually. So of the comprehensive students, because those are the ones who we are like responsible for in every way, um, you can see the demographics, about 73% white, about 53% female, um, the, uh, a, a, majority, a large majority in 11th or 12th grade, although that's usually 70%, so it's a little bit lower right now. Um, right now, 22% have IEPs and almost 8% have 504 plans, so that's about 30% altogether. Um, students with some kind of disability. And um, we have a split between metro area and, and rural areas in Minnesota, and about this, I didn't do a count yesterday, but about usually between 75 and 85 percent of our students are considered at risk under Minnesota's graduation incentives program and so those are students who come to us behind in credits or behind in basic skills or who are pregnant or parents or who have been assessed as chemically dependent um, we also see students who just like are strong and committed and focused and they want to get away from distraction and like do their work on their own timeline, you know, on their own weekly schedule. Um, somebody, one of our, the questions we were asked is about the student experience, and what I would say is, um, we have things that we put on students' plates each week to do, and we try to give them as much choice as possible within that, and we, um, in particular, give them a lot of choice about their schedules. So how, how are they going to get done? There's, there's something that they're expected to do each week in, in each course. So the question is, um, are they going to do it like, you know, all their chemistry on Monday, all their history on Tuesday? Are they going to do it at three in the morning? Are they going to do it only on the weekend because they're working around jobs? Um, so we, we have a pretty traditional curriculum, but it's teacher designed and it's focused on authentic assessment. And, um, and so the flexibility that students get is really control of their own schedule and that they can speed up through the things that are easy for them and slow down on the things that are hard for them, reach out for help when they need it, work alone when they don't need it. Um, so that's, that's the, um, our model in a nutshell. Hope I didn't go over time on that. 
No, nope, we're doing very well so far. Very well on time. Um, so there are similarities we have on our program. So we also opened in 2005. Uh, if I were to sum up our mission in a nutshell here, it is just that we um, have students that explore their passions and they find their place in the world. And that's our goal is to make sure everyone finds their place in the world. We do that. Our vision would be to empower students to find these passions, explore the passions, use personalized student-driven projects. We forge caring relationships. We are a leader in educational technology reform. And we also have a staff shared decision-making model of the teacher-powered school. Uh, the thing that I wanted to, to get across here is the experience of EOC for students. So we have real-time daily meetings through, via video conferencing and advisory. We also have one-on-one -on -one meetings with their advisors. We have field trips that are monthly. Community is a really big aspect of our experience at EOC. Um, we have experiential education trips, meaning that students actually go to other places, such as this um, February, they'll be going to Florida Everglades. We have hands-on project-based learning. Um, students design their schedule, and we have a really huge focus on life skills rather than content um, area skills. We do both, to be clear. We have academic skills as well, but we, uh, we really um, help students hone in on those life skills that they need to find their place in the world. Teachers are learning coaches, so we call them advisors. They are licensed in a specific area, but we work with students in cross-curricular projects. Um, so I will work with the same group of students in all of their academic areas, but I collaborate with other advisors in those content areas to help out with those projects. Um, we do sometimes do advisor-led projects, um, seminars um, that are near and dear to our heart and students' needs that teachers, um, have a lot of room and time for professional growth uh, during because of how we have done our professional development planning and also the fact that we participate in a program in Minnesota called QCOMP, which is a um, performance pay type of program in um, Minnesota meant for um, developing educators. We measure our students' hope, which is something important that is their engagement, their belongingness, their autonomy, and their academic press all combined into one number um, and so we monitor that to make sure that because there is a correlation between um, after school, uh, high school success and a high hope score, we want to make sure our students are full of hope. These are some pictures of field trips. Our demographics, similar to what Elisa said, um, we only have 113 students. We are a comprehensive school only, so our students are only enrolled with us. We don't do any supplemental students. About 55% of our population is male, 45% female, 90% of our population is Caucasian or white. We have about a 50-50 split of students that live in the suburban Minneapolis metropolitan area and the more rural areas, 20% free reduced lunch and a 32% special education 504 plan ratio. For ratios, someone asked about the staff-student ratio. We have eight to one staff-to-student ratio, um, so a very low ratio there. Um, we retain 82.4% of our students. We have a 94.7% attendance rate. Um, and last year, 21 seniors were enrolled in October of 2017, and 18 of those graduated and three received the GED. So that is the sum of a division. And then we have a little bit else, and I'll turn it back over to Lisa. I think we still have a few minutes left, is how we think about technology. And when we think about technology, we think about content, pedagogy, and technological knowledge, which is a framework out of Michigan State University. And we ask the questions, what are the core performance tasks of my discipline, and what will students create, and how will they share it with others? Um, at Minnows, that's more teacher directed than it is at Ed Visions. But the thing that's interesting is Gigi and I see eye to eye about this being the foundation of instructional design. So um, I think, Gigi, we should just skip to the last slide. And, um, and so when people ask about technology, what I think is important to remember about technology is it's not about pushing content towards students. It's about evoking performance from students. So um, you know, we've just got some examples here of mathematical modeling, writing music, creating spreadsheets to figure stuff out. Um, editing, photo editing photographs, sharing photographs, commenting on them. So um, 
I would like to say more about that. There was a question about what do we mean by authentic assessment? This is what I mean by that, that it's not, it's not a question of what curriculum am I going to buy and deliver on a plate to a student. It's what does a student need to do to show mastery in whatever subject they're learning and how are we going to use technology for them to demonstrate that and share it with their teachers and peers. So I think we did it. <laughs> you did it and, and did it admirably and well. Thank you so much, Elisa and, and Gigi. We're going to move on now to uh, the uh, responses to our polling question number one. Here we have it. Do you have an opinion about virtual online schools? If so, what is it? 4% no opinion. Not surprised. 43% it's probably good for some students. 50% it's definitely the future of education. And 4% it's a waste of public money. So we're, we're, we're hugely in the positive on this one, guys. That was that was fascinating. Um, I have to say that that I would definitely be in that fifty percent with regard to the future. I also want to say to um, to Fernando and He Jin, uh, Robin, Laurie, Laura, your questions are coming in, and we're going to get to those in the Q and A right after our our next uh, section, our our next school, which is Metro East Web Academy in Oregon. Tanya, you're up. Great. All right, well, welcome. Thank you all. Uh, so I, again, I'm Tanya from Metro East Web Academy. And let me just minimize this here. Uh, there we go. Uh, so we are a virtual school that was started in 2009. Uh, we were funded by federal grants to develop an online school. This was started with our district, so it was in partnership with our district. And the purpose was to provide an option for students that were disengaged from our school uh, district. And based on that data, they determined there was about 500 students not currently enrolled. So we're a little bit unique because we were created uh, based on something that the district was looking for, a different option for students. So we're currently redrafting our vision. We did have a pretty long one. It was, it was wordy. And what we found after interviewing different stakeholders is that we had a vision and it, it definitely had a, a direction, but in talking to our stakeholders and other families and students and board members and teachers, really what we found is the purpose of Metro East Web Academy is to transform education by providing multiple innovative pathways for student success. So we do that through our guiding principles of innovative instruction, safe, passionate, and inclusive environment and collaborative partnerships. So where we are now, we serve all students. Uh, we actually are, our data from the Oregon, excuse me, the Oregon report card uh, based on our state assessments is that we're the highest performing online school in Oregon. And we were rated the third highest performing uh, state test scores uh, in the region for all the schools. Uh, and we're the only online NCA certified eligible uh, online school in Oregon that we know of. Uh, and what we found, the students that we serve are students that their needs have not been met in a traditional program. So we'll serve students across the academic and social emotional spectrum. Students that are medically fragile, bullying issues at school, they have a lot of anxiety. We have a lot of students that are credit deficient. Usually over 62% of our students come to us credit deficient. We have TAG, uh, accelerated students. And right now we've started the program in 2009 with 73 students and we are roughly about 600 students with half of those as seniors. So we are quite senior heavy. So we get a lot of students that transfer in. And we have five programs. We have our K-6 program. We have what we call our traditional online program, which is seventh through 12th grade. Uh, we offer a credit retrieval program. We call that the MIWA Advantage Program, or MAP for short. Uh, we like to tell our students, we help them chart their course. Uh, they are given two classes uh, in, a, in a shorter period of time over a four-week span uh, to really give that focus and intense structure for those two classes it, to ultimately retrieve credits a little bit faster. We also use proficiency and competency-based instruction in that program. We have a GED program that's been really successful and an early college program where students attend the local community college in their area and they receive dual credit, both college and high school credit for those classes. And last year we had 24 students graduate with an associate's degree 
in Oregon. Uh, so we're pretty proud of some of those statistics. And now this is the important thing, I think, is the learning experience. What students experience. So we have a synchronous learning uh, options where students are required to attend a certain time. Uh, it's once a week per class, so over a course of a week, students will log on and participate in these learning sessions about six or seven times. They all, that is also uh, coupled with asynchronous classroom instruction that has digital curriculum when we use a couple different models. Uh, Florida Virtual is one of our curriculum partners. And I think part of our success with our state test scores and our performance is because of the rigor and standards that Florida Virtual has. So uh, if you're looking for programs or options, they're a great one to use. And that's coupled also with our teacher created curriculum. So the content's delivered online, it's through interactives, uh, there's uh, videos and, and texts and manipulatives that they can use. So it, it becomes very involved for them to uh, go through their, their work. Um, one of the questions was about authentic assessments. We authenticate our assessments through different options. Uh, we do have face-to-face -face options, small group settings, one-to-one -one instruction. So one of the myths, I think, or, or uh, perceptions of online learning that students are behind a screen, but in reality, that's the opposite of that. What we find is our teachers really interact with those students more one-on-one. -on -one. They get to know the students a little bit better. You know, some of our comments from our teachers over the years is, you know, I was in a traditional school and I had, you know, 180 kids. I didn't know half of them. I mean, I knew their names, but I didn't know half of them. Where on, in the online world, because when you are interacting with a student, it's usually one-to-one -one, and they get to know their students so much better, which gives us the opportunity to make specialized, individualized instruction to tailor student needs and, and to meet those needs of those students through a personalized learning plan. Uh, the other piece is students are part of a learning community. They interact with their teachers and other peers through those synchronous learning sessions. We offer a lot of field trips, community events, service projects, but the, given also the flexibility to work independently. Uh, so we have a couple different uh, partnerships. We partner with uh, Native American Rehabilitation Association, uh, which is uh, for students that uh, are in a drug and alcohol treatment program, so we are able to find their academic needs. During that time, we also partner with some sports academies, such as uh, we have one that's here close by on our, our mountain that a lot of the students participated in uh, the last Winter Olympics. So it gives us some flexibility with that academic side to then meet the needs of students, um, their other needs um, through life. Our teachers, have flexible schedules. Uh, we do have on-site meetings so that we can create a collaborative culture with them, build strong relationships with our students. We give their, our teachers the freedom to create curriculum to meet the student needs. Uh, all of our teachers are highly qualified and licensed, and we really encourage uh, the teachers uh, to experiment with new ideas by giving them the freedom to do so and the resources they need in order to create and innovate instruction for our students. See. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Can you, can you finish this out with the political climate? Yeah, I can talk. So one of the questions was about political climate. So we, again, have a great working relationship with our sponsoring district. Uh, we continue to build our positive reputation through Oregon. Um, there always is new legislation that comes out to stifle progress of charter and online schools here in, in our state. And we continue to keep that dialogue open, working with the Oregon Department of Education and some other political partnerships to uh, change some of that division of, of online schools through new legislation. We were part of an organization that supports that legislation, have written some laws or written some uh, bills that have become laws to help support charter schools and virtual learning opportunities for our students. All right. Thank you, Tanya. That's, that's terrific how, how you've been put in a position to take a leadership role within your state with regard to uh, policy, statute, and, and working with other important stakeholders in Oregon. So, so thank you very much for that. We've got about 15 minutes left, and, and, and time is fleeting in this, in this format. So let's get into our round-robin discussion and, and, and try to hit these off. But let's, uh, I, I do want to wanna once again uh, say to Fernando Hejin, Laurie Fernando, Robin, Laura, Mary, we, we, we're going to get to your questions, but we have a few things we want to hit first. Um, number one, Alyssa, Kimmy, and Tanya, 
Uh, very quickly, one myth each. What is, what is one of the greatest myths that you want our participants to know that as you, as you rolled out your online learning program, uh, folks said things that, were going to, uh, that, that you were going to do, and in fact, it didn't transpire. Uh, you know, I have experience, I a designer operator of two online schools, one's an ingenuity school, one's a summit learning school, and, and the things that people say when you are beginning this path is absolutely unbelievable. So tell, tell our participants very quickly, what are some of the, the myths uh, that, 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 you, uh, that you busted or debunked in your work? Alyssa, you want to go first? Sure. I, I think that um, I've heard people say that online learning makes teachers irrelevant. And we're, I, I, some of these are smaller schools like Ed Visions, like Minnows, exist to do quite the opposite, to say that um, a teacher is relevant in a different way. Um, this is not, as you said, a personnel reduction strategy. Um, we're not, we don't see value in, in doing a content push or assigning 600 course enrollments or 400 or 300 even to one teacher. Um, we say, like, like um, Tanya said, that in a bricks and mortar school, a teacher would work with 180 students, and we cut that in half. We say a full-time teaching load is about half of that, so 80 to 100, because it's more labor intensive, and it's, um, you know, you have to work hard to connect students when you're not face to face with them to, to, to connect with them. So we, we believe there's a very important role for teachers and, um, and this is not about somehow making that go away. Okay, uh, Kimmy, and I wanna say also, Kimmy, I apologize for stepping on your PowerPoint at the very end there. In, in my rookie newbiness of moderator, I was getting nervous on time. So, so mea culpa on that. But Kimmy, can you come back to us and, 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 and tell us about a, a myth that, in, that Inspire dealt with and busted? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we get this every once in a while, um, the reference that somehow um, we're not a real school. Um, as a public um, charter or as a non-site based, uh, you know, school. Um, somehow we're not real. Um, and that kind of always gives me pause because just because we look a little bit different, just because we operate a little bit differently, it's not cookie cutter. It's not, um, you know, the way school was done necessarily in the past doesn't mean that we're not real. You know, our students, um, are held accountable um, for the very same uh, grade level standards as any other student in the state of California. We participate in state testing, um, you know, the SBAC and the, the CAS test. We, we even get our kiddos out there and we do our, our physical fitness testing, our fitness gram. Um, so, you know, wanting to just Say for the record, you know, we pride ourselves on being a high quality, legitimate educational organization um, that, yeah, we're pushing the boundaries a little bit and yeah, we look a little bit different, um, but I'm just so grateful to be able to provide an educational platform in a, in a different way that meets the needs of a, not every student, right? Not every student can, can be an independent study student or a virtual learner, but um, there are many, many that can. It is the new um, way of, of, of training and education. So um, that, was, that was my little myth right. for you it, guys. It's, a, it's about changing marketplaces and, and meeting uh, a consumer demand for a 21st century education that's relevant to 21st century students. Uh, Tanya, your myth. Yeah, so one of the counters, I guess, to virtual education and online education is the idea that students are not, um, we're not meeting the needs of the soft skills or the social emotional skills that students need in a traditional uh, brick and mortar school. And for us, that, that really is a misnomer. We have a lot of opportunities for students to build those soft skills, build those social emotional skills. Uh, we have those synchronous learning sessions where students are required to be just like we are your face out there on the camera, you're interacting with, with their peers, they're interacting with their students. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities uh, such as field trips and opportunity, opportunities here on site for students to get together. And because it is directed for that specific purpose, I think they actually gain more uh, in that moment than they would in a traditional school where that social emotional piece is, is also in conjunction with the, the academic piece where they have to be in school, they have to be quiet, there's no discussion, they have to be learning, they have a few minutes of passing period where they're able to connect 
where here it's very purposeful and very specific for that reason. We had two students, they were cousins, and one of them, they're both in our early college program. One of them came through our online program before they entered the early college. The other one came from a brick and mortar school. And it's interesting to see the comparison side by side because the one that was a product of, of our virtual school really is having a, a lot easier time interacting with their teachers, being able to ask the questions and getting the help that they need, being proactive within their education because that's what's built in to our virtual school. So it actually, I think, gives them more tools for soft skills than, than being in a traditional setting. All right, thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Uh, fascinating, this has been a whirlwind 50 minutes so far, folks, and we are now going into the home stretch of our webinar. Let's get to the questions for, that some of our, uh, our, our viewers, our participants out there uh, have asked. Um, I wanna say to Mary, that I am, I am positive, and I haven't talked to Steve about this yet, but I am confident that the PowerPoint presentations that have been, that have been showcased today can be made available to you uh, uh, from, from, the, from the schools directly through CPIX in the next coming up, uh, in the next few upcoming days. I'm sure that those can be made available, Mary. Um, let's, let's take Laura's question, uh, and, and this is a round robin format, so, so Kimmy, Gigi, Elisa, Tanya, uh, weigh in please. Assessment strategies and authentic assessment. What does that look like in your school? Sure, um, I can start. Mm -hmm. Authentic assessment is uh, for us all kinds of different things, but it's not usually tests that have bubbles. The um, authentic assessment that we look at is the products they're producing. They create. What are they creating? Um, doing live presentations, doing things in their community, um, coming, for, but all of the students will end up coming back to what we call our proposal team. They'll come back to a team of teachers in which they have to do an interview about their project and they're asked content questions and process questions and all of these different pieces that have to do with their project. And then they'll receive credit. So they actually, it's a lot like a thesis might be. So that is where our authentic piece comes in. All right, thank you. Let's, Fernando has been asking questions about about support systems. What support systems are in place for struggling students? What support systems are in place for communication between schools and families? Um, what, what type of support systems are in place to lead to such phenomenal graduation rates? So uh, Gigi, Elisa, Tanya, Kimmy, uh, can you discuss uh, your support, the support systems in your schools? Yeah, I'd love to take this one. So you, Tanya. we actually have quite a lot of support systems uh, because most of our students come to us at risk. We're either credit deficient, at risk, uh, you know, usually there's a story behind every student. And that's one important piece that we always try to uh, stress about how we as an organization work is we, we need to understand our students and know, uh, you know, what's going on. So we have a support system or what we call RAISE, which is working with engaging students because a lot of our students are uh, non-engaged students um, when they show up uh, from their their schools uh, so it is it is a, one of our biggest challenges and I think that maybe that's across the board but talking to other online schools engagement really is one of our, our huge challenges so we have a family engagement coordinator that works with on the family level to help meet the needs of the families in order for the student to focus on education. So that's one of our biggest structures that we have in place. Uh, when our students come to us, we have a welcome meeting process orientation where we really uh, hit uh, the educating the parent of what it takes for a student to be successful at the school and also educating the parent the systems that we use. We use Canvas for our LMS. Uh, we just brought on a new SI system, uh, student information system that works with Canvas. Uh, we also create wraparound services. So we have social emotional supports. As I said, most of our students come because they've been bullied or anxiety. We offer bus passes for students if they need them, especially if they need to come to the site. Um, that's one way we get them to engage is, is offer bus passes, monthly bus passes to get them uh, where they need to go. Uh, we offer a bref breakfast and lunch to families on site. So if they're in the area and come in, we make sure that those needs are met. If they're not in the area, we, we look at uh, trying to uh, connect them with other resources uh, out there that's within their area. 
uh, you know, any really whatever support the family needs, we try to get it for them. We try to find daycare for our parents, um, for our students that are parents so that they can focus on their education that we'll fund. Uh, we have, again, our technology, I don't know if we'll touch on that, but offer the technology that, that families may need and other um, services. So we have quite a huge support to try to really build that engagement through our school. All right, thank you, Tanya. Let's go to Laurie's question, which is, which is one that, that, that that's often comes up when, when we're dealing with the topic of online or virtual learning, and that's academic integrity or cheating, or how do you know that the kids are actually and really doing the work? So, uh, uh, Kimmy, uh, can, you, can you take that one for us? How, do, how, do, uh, how does Inspire know that, that the work is genuine? Sure, absolutely. So our teachers are required at minimum to meet with their families um, at least once every learning period, which is every 20 school days. And works out to about once a month. Um, at those meetings and oftentimes at other um, in-person opportunities in between those meetings, field trips, special days, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, the teacher is evaluating the student's body of work. Um, and so as a certificated um, you know, agent of the state, um, you know, we are counting on our teachers and have provided training and supports to make sure they know how to glean, assess, monitor, um, and track the students' learning. Um, so it's not, um, you know, this random like, oh, maybe they did or maybe they didn't. Um, our teachers are able to um, use their knowledge and skill set of, you know, appropriate learning, um, progress monitoring, um, ensuring, um, you know, not just the quality but fidelity of the work. Um, and so we glean that a lot of times through um, work product um, or work samples. Um, the students will bring sort of a portfolio of their body of work. Um, a lot of conversations are happening, uh, sharing of photos of those um, projects that they've done out in the community or with um, enrichment vendors. Um, so it's kind of a compilation of all of those things. Um, but we, we definitely, um, you know, make that a priority to make sure that we are providing documentation, that our um, teachers are verifying the work, um, and, and that this child has done it. Now, we, I will say that there are occasionally some times where the teacher can tell and has determined that it's not the student's work, and then we follow our um, non-compliance policies and, and procedures for that. So there's a mechanism of what to do when um, you know, it's found that the student has cheated or the parent potentially has falsified um, a work product or sample. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Kimmy. Thank you very much. Um, you know, there's, there's two questions we don't have time for, but what they are, a departure point, is for our next webinar. Um, Robin, with regard to curriculum and universal design, that is an essential question, especially as schools begin to uh, custom customize and sort of home build curriculum and not just use Edgenuity or Summit as, as, as some of my schools do. Um, also, Heejin, the online platforms, the actual, the actual mechanism of how this is done, the, a more in-depth conversation about what does the typical day look like, we're just going to have to save that for, uh, for round two. But right now, we're going to go into our second polling question, our second polling question of the webinar. Has this webinar changed how you look at virtual online education in schools? If so, how? didn't really change my point of view. I see more potential, but nothing that applies to my school or organization. I see more potential and learn things that could be applied to my school or organization, or this webinar was a game changer for me. I wish we had sort of that, uh, that, that, that countdown music, but here is, or here are the results. 48% really didn't change my point of view. 7%, I see more potential, but nothing that applies to my school. 48%, I see potential and learn things that could be applied to my school or organization. And 4%, this, this webinar was a game changer for me. Well, you know, as, as someone who does the bricks and mortar end of this, I have to say this webinar was a game changer for me because, because the, the, the non-classroom based uh, part of our sector, that, that, that sort of periphery, which is driving change to the middle and to the mainstream, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, let's now, uh, uh, let's just quickly wrap this up because what we saw today or what we heard were four schools that were approaching 
education, a, a, a 2000 year old Socratic, whether it was a meal, whether it's the malting house, whether it's A.S. Neal, whether it's Ted Sizer, we've, we've turned the page in the 21st century and we're beginning to experiment in, in ways to, to teach and learn that didn't even exist 20 years ago. It's a, it's a, fascinating, it's a fascinating era that we're in. And in 10 years, when, when the models that we talked about today are so commonplace that they're ubiquitous, we're going to look back on this era and thank schools like Inspire and Edvisions and Minnesota Online and Metro East. And we're going to say thank you for doing that pioneering work. Thank you for being charter schoolers. And thank you, thank you, thank you for participating in this webinar. And, and we're, you know, Steve and I and the crew and the participators and, 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 and Rick and everyone, we're going to get together and we're going to talk about how can we do this in, in, in a deeper and more extended fashion? How can we bring online and virtual education uh, to the point where, you know what, <laughs> what's, the, what's the next revolution after this revolution? Uh, I want to bring back uh, 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 Steve Zimmerman for a CPIX uh, wrap up and goodbye. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank, thank, thanks, Rob. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, Kimmy, Tanya, Alyssa, Gigi, uh, Rob. You guys did a great job. I hope, I hope everyone out there, you know, got something out of this. Um, this was really uh, revelatory to me because New York State actually does not charter any virtual or online schools, and they're, you know, very proud of the fact that they keep very, very tight reins on everything. But and so. Uh, you know, I, I really had limited knowledge of it. And now, you know, just working with these guys has, has opened up a whole lot to me. I hope it's been valuable to uh, all the folks out there. Um, please um, join CPIX. Uh, we need you. Edward, put up the contact uh, sheet on the, the screen here. Here's the, here are the folks. Um, this will be, this webinar will be available for you to review uh, online in a, in, in a day. We'll send it out to everyone. Um, we'll also um, you know, you'll, you'll have everyone's contact information for questions that didn't get answered. Uh, thanks again um, to everyone for participating and um, all you uh, viewers out there, you know, please help support uh, CPICS by, by joining up, becoming a member. Um, we're working on the next webinar. I think it's going to be called, it's innovation in authorization. Okay, like we're all the onus is always on us as charter people. We're the innovators, but you know what? With innovative authorization, we could do even more. So uh, we've got some folks in the world of authorization that are going to help lead that next webinar. We think it's going to be a great one. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and uh, we'll see you at the ne next time. Thanks.